Unique people leading unique lives shape and inform Iowa City. This community is enhanced by these women and men who live in our midst, working, teaching, creating. Welcome to a series of conversations with people who have stories to tell. Join my guests and me, Ellen Buchanan, in a series of interviews called One of a Kind. My guest on One of a Kind is Martha Luberoff. She and her husband arrived in Iowa City in 1973, thinking it was a temporary move. Fast forward 40 years, and they are still here. With a degree in business, Martha worked in various areas. For 15 years, she was a dedicated, well-respected, and loved employee at the Iowa City Public Library. Precipitated by an illness in her family, Martha became involved in the hospice movement in Iowa City. She and another woman, Mary Child, developed a task force to look into establishing a hospice organization. In 1983, Iowa City Hospice became incorporated and now is a vital and necessary part of our community. The same year hospice was incorporated, it served its first patient. Martha will explain what went into getting this remarkable organization started and where it is today. Martha and her husband David raised three sons in Iowa City, Saul, Scott, and Matthew. They have six grandchildren. Welcome to One of a Kind. Thank you, Ellen. I know your story begins in Philadelphia in mm -hmm. 1940. Tell me just a bit about your first family. My first family, my parents, my father's name was Sidney. My mother's name was Bessie. Uh, my father had been born in New Jersey. My mother was born in Philadelphia. Um, both of their sets of parents were immigrants from Europe. Mm -hmm. um, they were married for several, many years until my father passed away. And then um, we lived a long, long time without him. He was only 49 when he died. Mm. And you have a sister? I have a sister, Helen, mm -hmm. who's three years younger than I am. And she moved to California to get her master's in social work with her then husband. And uh, they were divorced and she has since remarried, has two children, my niece and my nephew. Mm -hmm. And um, I have two great nephews and uh, try to see her at least once a year or, or more often whenever we can coordinate it. How did you meet your husband, David? I met David at a B'nai B'rith youth organization um, dance for young adults. Mm -hmm. I had seen him around because I knew his sister. I had seen him at a jazz concert. And when he saw me, he was totally blown away by the fact that I was at a jazz concert. It was Ahmed Jamal. Mm -hmm. And I approached him at the dance and asked him how he liked it. And we went back and forth. And then he called me up and we went out on a date. And that was that. The rest was history. You the moved around a lot, didn't you? We moved to Washington, D.C. We, we were, when we first were married, we lived in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And um, he was finishing up his schooling. And then he got a position at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., working towards his master's and then his doctorate. And after Washington, D.C., um, we moved to New Haven, Connecticut, and he finished his degree at Yale. And I had my first son there. And when we left, I was pregnant with Scott. Mm -hmm. And we moved back to Philadelphia, where he was with the University of Pennsylvania, until we got the position here in Which Iowa. brought you to Iowa. And, and his then field we came. is? Him. He is an immunologist. Mm -hmm. His primary research right now is on prostate cancer. And he's been working very hard on a clinical trial for a vaccine that he developed. And he's in the second phase of that trial. And it appears that it's going well. So we have hopes 
And here you thought you were just coming for a short time yeah, and fast yeah. you're 40 years later. Right, right. So what, so, some of your story has to do with hospice, a very important part mm -hmm. of your story. Mm -hmm. What was the, gen what precipitated you to get so heavily and passionately involved in the hospice? Okay. Um, well, my father had died and he died in the hospital and everything was mysterious and the doctors used metaphors for everything and we were, never really knew exactly what was going on with him. Then when my mother became ill with her cancer, uh, my sister and I decided that that wasn't going to happen again, that we were going to care for her at home. And um, at a certain point, my mother and my Aunt Sarah, who my mother was living with, um, moved into my sister's house. And when things started looking really grim, my sister notified me. I told her, just let me know. And I went out there with Matthew. The other two boys stayed home with David, and he had to arrange for child care. Matthew was young enough. He came with me. And um, we took care of my mother at home. We didn't have a formal hospice. As a matter of fact, we were not encouraged very much mm -hmm. by her family, her doctor, who would talk to us on the phone and say, you know, I don't know why you're doing this. This is too hard for you to manage. And we just said, we're going to figure it all out. And we did. And we took care of her at home, and we managed her. And we had some very, very nice times with her mm -hmm. at the end. We shared recipes with her, and we'd run in with them to have her taste them. And <laughs> my sister would garden out her window. Mm -hmm. My mother loved gardenias. Mm -hmm. And my sister had a gardenia bush, and we would pin one on her pillowcase all the time. So by doing, providing that for your mother, you were in Iowa City and you, you thought, I you, came, you read about... I came back to Iowa City and I started sharing my experience mm -hmm. with some of my friends. Betty Mizell, mm -hmm. who was then the director of the Senior Center, um, told me about Mary Child, who was getting her degree in social work and whose interest was death and dying and hospice. And she put the two of us together, and we said, okay, what can we do to get started? And we <laughs> had an interest meeting. I think we had it at Mercy. But I was here in this library mm -hmm. many, many times calling, getting names and phone numbers for people and making phone calls to the visiting nurses, to the pharmacists, to anybody that I could think of that w might be interested. And we had a very large meeting Helen Zerwas was there. She spoke about her son, mm -hmm. <clears throat> who had had hospice care. And then we showed a film that we had found and rented. And from that, we developed this task force who began meeting. And as a result of that, we then developed a board of directors. I was the first president, uh -huh. of course. <laughs> and we had a lot of help from an attorney in town, Bruce Hoppert, mm -hmm. was a big help. He did our incorporation mm -hmm. papers and our bylaws, and he just kind of led us along the way. And we started raising money, and the first fundraiser we had was a hospice race uh, at City Park, mm -hmm. which my husband coordinated, because he, he is a runner, was <laughs> a runner. And um, I don't know how many runners we have, not a lot, and we didn't make a lot of money, but we got Shirts donated from business people all over town. Uh, Nancy mm -hmm. Burhan from Gringos donated money for shirts. Bob Sirk from First mm -hmm. National, John's Groceries. Um, the cleaner, my, the dry <laughs> cleaner gave us safety pins. Oh. And David got numbers from Nike, I think. And we just put it all together and um, we got registrants and one night we sat at Wendy Grumbeck's house, who was also very involved with hospice, and we put these packets together, and we did the run, walk. My son Matthew rode the bike mm -hmm. behind everybody. <laughs> he was tailing everybody, and we joke about that a lot, but that was how we began to raise some money. And then you, you had a physician who gave his time Charlie Driscoll. Charlie Driscoll. Charlie Driscoll 
Wendy and I went into his office to talk to him about hospice and how we were hoping that he would volunteer his time as a physician. And we were both very serious as we talked with mm -hmm. him. And he said, yeah, I will. And Wendy and I walked <laughs> out of family practice and we jumped in the air <laughs> screaming. <laughs> so he volunteered his time. How wonderful. wonderful. And your first um, um, patient coordinator was uh, Laureen New Neighbor mm -hmm. and uh, she came on and she was part-time. We had a little tiny office in uh, Mercy Hospital which they, do they donated along with a phone line mm -hmm. and Lori worked out of there and uh, worked with us for a period of time and then she left to do other things and we went through a couple of other coordinators, mm -hmm. but then we found Maggie Elliott, who's absolutely wonderful and has grown this hospice. And, and what I say about her is that the hospice that we have now has never deviated from what we all believed in back then. Mm -hmm. You know, we serve anybody and whether they can afford it or they can't afford it. And um, so it, it still makes me very happy. It's a wonderful organization yes. and it's uh, yes. grown, as you say. Absolutely. Uh, said, um, for someone who might be interested in mm -hmm. volunteering, what, what do you have to go through to become <clears throat> a certified hospice, hospice volunteer and what are their duties? The people who aren't on the you know, paid staff, but people who come right. in and say, I <clears throat> want to help out with hospice. Well, they have a training program that incorporates many, many subjects um, and they go through that. It's several weeks and then once they are officially a volunteer, they could be assigned to many tasks, uh, not necessarily giving patient care, although that's one of the things they could do is to go into a dying person's mm -hmm. home and either give respite care for their loved one or read to them or play music with them or put photos in an album for anything. And then there are other jobs for volunteers like taking people to the grocery store or driving back and forth for an appointment. We have volunteers that bring in animals now mm -hmm. for pet therapy. And so almost anything you could think of, I, I have a woman, I had a woman friend who died uh, about a year ago and um, she loved her yard and I understand that hospice put a bed out on her porch for her mm -hmm. so she could be enjoy in her it. yard and enjoy it. Enjoy it. So almost anything that anybody, and also volunteering in the office, you know, helping with mailing. So if someone wants to volunteer but they're not comfortable mm -hmm. uh, dealing with dying patients, they could volunteer to be in the office. Like I interviewed Ginger Nowak and she's right. spent a lot of time in the office right. besides with with patients right. I know too. Right. And is there, a, I always, is there a time limit that hospice, I mean the patient can be in hospice? Well it always was, I don't know if that's mm -hmm. changed at all but it it used to be a terminal diagnosis of three to six months. So I don't know, mm -hmm. you know, I can't speak to that okay. exactly. I was wondering. But that's what it was and I imagine it's something like that. So you still keep track of what's happening at I hospice? I do, I do. Maggie contacts me from time to time to speak to a mm -hmm. group. Uh, David and I do the Hospice Walk for Dignity every year and we've been raising a lot of money. Great. They're putting up a donor wall at Hickory, is it Park? Hickory Park? Uh -huh. Where the walk starts. Mm -hmm. And there's this little garden there that has the hospice the garden. Yes. yes. Well, they're going to put up a wall that will have donors on there, um, both financial donors and donors in kind. Mm -hmm. And they called to find how we wanted our team because it's just David and Martha mm -hmm. team together. So that's how I know about that. Gotcha. So yeah, I you try to keep up. Sure. 
So your next chapter of your life was your time here at the Iowa City Public Library. Yeah. Uh, I know, I think you really loved those 15 years here. I did. And I know the staff really cared for you. Um, what, what did you do? I mean, was it a challenge or did you just kind of slip in and, and take over? What, what yeah. were your duties? Yeah. Anything Susan wanted me to do. Well, I actually started out working with Lolly, with Lolly who I loved. Mm -hmm. And when Lolly interviewed me, I, it's a wonder she hired me <laughs> because she called me. Well, Betty Mizell recommended her, me to her. And she called me for an interview, and I was taking a master's swim class at the field house. Mm -hmm. And I said, I can't come until after that. <laughs> and I came with my hair wet, and she gave me some tests, and I did really badly on the math because I was not a math wizard. Mm -hmm. um, some percent percent change. So I said, "Well, I I need to come back and finish this test." <laughs> so I went home, and and Lolly knows this. I'm not giving away a secret. I went home and I called my son Scott, and I said, "How do I do this?" So he told me how to do it, and I figured it out. Come to find out, we have computers and <laughs> yes. all kinds of machines. I didn't, but Lolly was a real statistician, and numbers mattered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I started out just kind of doing what she wanted me to do, and was secretary to the board For of trustees. Mm -hmm. You were president at the time, right? Right. And then Lolly left, and I came to work for Susan. And I just think I did administrative assistant type mm -hmm. things. I, I organized some things that I thought we would, the library would like to do. We had, um, we did the book cart for the, Hawk, the homecoming parade. And, and I, I had a woman friend, Maureen Delaney, who worked here. Mm -hmm. And we became the Iowa City the in-service day fairies. Oh. And we started a tradition. You go back and look at tapes. Okay. Where we did a skit at every in-service day. We pretended, well, we were fairies. Mm -hmm. We came in with those little dealy boppers on our head yep. and we had a theme, a song or two, and we had a lot to work with because we were getting the new building. And my favorite one that we did was to YMCA <laughs> where we all wore, um, construction outfits and the whole song was about the building and uh, we even had Joel who was the building manager um, dancing it with us so so you provided not only did you do statistics and secretarial work you were the entertainment well, for yeah, these in-service days if it was anything that I could get into, I would do it. So after you retired, mm -hmm. you became very involved in the Senior Center. Correct. And I, you're a woman of many parts. You're, you're a drummer. I'm a drummer. But tell me about this. How did you happen? To, did you always drum? No. Oh, no. I played okay. piano as a kid, but mm -hmm. I'm very musical. I love music. I love rhythm. And I saw an ad in the paper one week that the Senior Center was offering, besides the New Horizon band, they were offering um, a beginner band for people who either used to play an instrument, wanted to do it again, or never played an instrument and wished that they could. And I thought, mm. ah, this is my moment. Because <laughs> I always told my kids, all three of my kids are musical, but none of them played the drums. It wasn't until I had a grandson played the drums. Mm -hmm. So I went and I rented a drum and then I think I bought a drum from a gentleman who passed away at the senior center and his son sold me his drum. I felt like I was carrying on a tradition. Sure. So I started in the beginner band. I was in the beginner band for, I don't know, three, four years. And then I started when I was still working and then when I retired. And then I went to a band camp at the University of Iowa had, like they had band camp mm -hmm. for the kids. Well, they had one for us. And I went and I played on the stage for the concert and I just, I was playing Crash Cymbal for one song. <laughs> and I was counting and counting and counting and counting. And all of a sudden the song was over. 
And you, I was counting wrong, that's all. So I was, I never. Did you crash the symbol <laughs> at the end of the I song? I never got to do that. But I learned a lot about. Uh -huh. you and you, love, you must love it. I do, I do. And now you've graduated to the now the I'm next in the New level. Horizon band, yeah. The Senior Center really has a lot of activities and Absolutely. choices, doesn't it? Absolutely. And you're also involved in what's this advanced planning? The senior for okay. seniors. Yeah. This actually came about through hospice who started the initiative. And it's advanced care planning, which we now call honoring your wishes. We we kind of bought the program from an entity that started it in um, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And they came to talk to us, gave us several in-services. We had a pilot program here at the Senior Center where we, we were trained as facilitators and then we were able to facilitate a discussion. They call it a guided discussion with people to help them make their choices about the end of life, mm -hmm. to name a designated healthcare recipient, to make decisions about how they want the end of their life to be in terms of um, extraordinary measures. Sure. So I did that for a, couple, for a year or two with a pilot program. How was the response, excuse me? It, I've, I've interviewed several, uh, many people, and um, most people are very appreciative of it and like it mm -hmm. a lot and want to do it and know they should do it. Mm -hmm. And we um, have it set up so once they complete their paperwork, we have two people in the senior center who are notaries. And so they notarize it and mm -hmm. we make copies of it for them to send to whoever they mm -hmm. want. And uh, we usually try to have two meetings, one to introduce it to them and we give mm -hmm. them information that they can take home and discuss. And then they'll make a second appointment in which we finalize the paperwork, get it notarized. I always ask my guests, who or what has had a major influence on you? Who has influenced you, Martha? Hmm. Well, my husband, mm -hmm. I think. He's, um, he's a very good man, very kind. He's a good grandparent. I think I would have to say Lolly influenced me, Susan influenced me. Um, I have a good friend, Sue Simon. I would say she's influenced me. What did Susan and Lolly do <clears throat> for you that? Um, well, they kind of gave me the freedom to take on things for them mm -hmm. that I. And grow and, and learn. grow with it and then give them something back for it. Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. but I think there were strong influences. Mm -hmm. Now, the other chapter of your life is are your children oh, and yeah. grandchildren. Tell me, mm -hmm. you have three sons. Tell me where they are and what they're doing. Okay, I have three sons. Saul, mm -hmm. my eldest, it lives here in Iowa City. He's a professional musician. Ah, music again. Yeah, it comes up often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He plays the saxophone. He gives private lessons, and he plays in a number of bands. He's, he's gotten to be very well known here and gets called on to be in bands. And he's had to deal with a disorder called Tourette's Syndrome all of his life, mm -hmm. which has made his life very hard. But he doesn't let it stop him. He just keeps plugging along. And um, he's got two sons. Zane is 20, and uh, after a year and a half in college, he decided that wasn't for him, and he's the manager of the Whitey's Ice Cream mm -hmm. Store. Will, the second son, um, just amazed all of us with his talents. Uh, Will was the kind of kid that nobody ever had to say, you know, you might think about, he just did it. Mm -hmm. um, he went to Spain his senior year with, at City High. He plays guitar, plays jazz guitar beautifully, and he sang beautifully. He sings beautifully. How wonderful. And uh, was singing all the time at City High. And he's very good about arranging mm -hmm. and making up his own music. 
So he's now at University of Northern Iowa studying mm -hmm. vocal ed. Music, music, music. And the next yeah. son? The next son is Scott, uh -huh. who uh, got his doctorate in music at Michigan State University. And he is now the director of bands at University of Central Missouri. And he's a wonderful educator. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud of him and a wonderful conductor. He took his band, his wind ensemble, to Carnegie Hall a couple of years ago. And My we goodness. all went, and we were at the concert, and it was marvelous. Yeah, imagine so. And he's married to a wonderful woman named Mary, who I say is the glue in that family. Mm -hmm. And she teaches strings in a town called Lee Summit, which is mm -hmm. not yeah. very far from Warrensburg, where they live. And they have two children. Andrew uh, is a freshman at Michigan State. He's studying political science. And he's in the marching band there, the Spartan marching band. And he loves it. We That's went great. up for a weekend to see him march. And now he's all excited about a bowl game. And he's playing in the pep band for basketball. Mm -hmm. Then there's Sarah, our only granddaughter, uh -huh. who was the light of my life. And she's a dancer. Mm -hmm. She does tap, ballet, jazz, hip hop. And uh, she goes to recitals. We go to her recitals, but she's also in many competitions Great. because she's very good. And then there's Matthew. Your third son. Matthew and Nicole, who live in Missoula. Mm -hmm. And Matthew is in business. He, he works for a company that sells malpractice insurance to attorneys and he's a client manager there and, and his they wife, have two children they have two children alexander who will be six and jackson who is about a year and a half and his wife is a physician um she's a pathologist she runs the medical lab at the hospital mm. and we try to see them a lot you travel a lot, we and there's always music it, in your you gatherings, bet. I'm you sure. Bet. That's great. Um, I was, uh, do you have time to read for pleasure? And if you do, what, are, what kind of books are by your bedside? Well, I love my Kindle. Uh-huh. Oh, you've got, and okay. I load whatever sounds good to me. My favorite books are mystery books. Mm -hmm. You're a mystery um, reader. And I like thrillers. Uh -huh. I mean, I really like you know, thrillers, Good. some people wouldn't like. Um, so that's what I read mostly. Mm -hmm. You love your Kindle. I love my Kindle. Good. Great. So I always ask my guests too, what, what are the things you like best about living in our community? Oh, it's cozy. Uh, you know, you almost don't go anywhere where you can't run into somebody you know. Mm -hmm. And I like that. Um, I think it's a fairly intellectual community, but it, there's a crossover. We were at a synagogue event, and Ethan Kane and his wife came in, and we visited with them for a little while. So there's, you know, there's all this crossover between people and their professions, mm -hmm. and and yet the community. So that's what I like. That's great. Well, thank you for being my guest. It's You're been welcome. fun hearing Thank your you. story. It's been fun. <laughs> My guest and one of a kind has been Martha Luberoff, a longtime employee of the Iowa City Public Library and co-founder of Iowa City Hospice. Words used to describe my guest are dedicated, courageous, determined, compassionate, well-respected, and a lot of fun. <laughs> Martha Luberoff is one of a kind.